Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Erin Lurie and I am the, adult, uh, the head of adult audiences here at Hillwood Estate Museum and Gardens and we are delighted to be here today to do a demonstration of our orchid repotting with Drew Asbury. We are in the process of getting everybody in from the waiting room. So I'm gonna give it just one more second. All right, it looks like almost everybody is in and I am so pleased to be with you today. Thank you very much for inviting us into your homes. Today is our final celebration of a virtual Orchid Month. We celebrate Orchid Month in March because this is when the largest variety of orchids are in bloom. Hillwood's greenhouses, which Drew Asbury is responsible for, are absolutely overflowing with stunning blooms right now. I hope that those of you who are in the DC area will be able to join us and um, visit in person to enjoy the fruits of Drew's labor, but I am also thrilled that we could gather virtually. For those of you in the DC area, we are, Hillwood is open. We do require advanced reservations, timed entry, masks, all of those good COVID safe protocols you would hope to find. You can find out more about planning your visit on Hillwood's website and I'll drop a link to that in the chat in just a few moments. We're very excited at Hillwood in just under a week and a half, we're about to open a spring exhibition called The Porcelain Flowers of Vladimir Konevsky. So there is plenty to see this spring at Hillwood. It's now my pleasure to turn you over to Drew Asbury, who is Hillwood's um, horticulturalist and volunteer manager. He has been with Hillwood since 2012 and is responsible for the greenhouses, cutting gardens, and the horticulture volunteer programs. Today, Drew is gonna be walking us through the process of repotting your orchid, and he's gonna be sharing some insights as well as a demonstration Please let us know what your questions are as they cross your mind. You can type those into the chat, which is down at the bottom of your screen. You may need to tap the screen or move your mouse to get that icon to come up. I will be spotlighting Drew's video, which means that he should appear nice and big on your screens. But if you are having trouble seeing, you might want to click the three dots over any other video and let Zoom hide non-video participants. That'll give you the best and biggest view of our expert. And as I said, we'll be relaying questions to Drew from the chat. I will be posing those to him. So please feel free to submit those questions as they cross your mind. And with that, I will turn us over to Drew. Well, thank you, Aaron, And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Again, my name is Drew Asbury. I'm the horticulturist and volunteer manager at Hillwood, and I'm super excited to be here today uh, to talk to you all about repotting orchids. Um, and in the next 20 minutes, my goal is to repot two Phalaenopsis orchids as well as one Cattleya orchid. Um, and we'll see how far we'll, we'll get there. But as Aaron mentioned, please uh, put your questions in the Q&A module there, um, and, and we'll get to those as soon as we can. Um, and so. Uh, uh, you know, I, I want to spend just a moment first, though, just talking about, you know, why are we re repotting our orchids and, you know, why is that such a critical step uh, for the long term uh, care and success of growing orchids at home. Um, and that's because the, the vast majority of orchids that are available to us as, as home gardeners, um, when, they're, when these orchids are growing in nature, they grow as epiphytes. Um, and epiphytes are plants that do not grow in the ground or in the soil as we commonly think of plants growing, uh, but rather their roots actually uh, attach their, these plants um, onto the branches and the trunks, um, you know, and they're growing high up in the canopy of, of a potentially, you know, a rainforest or so. Um, and yet, so this lifestyle has drastic implica impl implications uh, for how when we take that plant out of nature, we put it in a pot and we're growing in our kitchen. Um, and I think this is, you know, one thing that makes growing orchids so, so drastically different 
um, than maybe our other traditional house plants. And this is also why um, that orchid media is all different types and it looks quite different than maybe that potting soil you might plant your African violets in. Um, so today we're gonna be looking at um, of multiple different types of potting media, but we're really going to spend most of our time here looking at bark-based medias. Um, and this is just a nice chunky media here. Uh, this is what I've always been um, drawn to in my, my years of growing orchids. Um, our greenhouse at Hillwood, we predominantly use uh, bark-based medias for our collection, as well as Hillwood's orchid specialist, Andrew Biedenball. He is a big fan of bark. So it's kind of the triple threat here at Hillwood. But there's a, the other school of thought out there is the sphagnum moss school. Um, and I know there are growers that grow exclusively in that. So really the choice is up to you and we'll talk a little bit more about those selections. But, but what both of those medias have in common is that they both provide that epiphytic nature around the roots. And that is they allow a lot of air to be inside the pot and they allow a lot of drainage, okay? And that's super, uh, super, super important um, to grow orchids well in the long term. But yet you can imagine if you have a pot filled with bark, um, you know, after a couple years, that soil starts to, that bark starts to break down a little bit. It begins to soil a little bit. Maybe those little pockets of air between all that chunky bark starts to collapse, right? So we end up with a pot that doesn't drain as well and doesn't get as much air in it. And that's why every couple of years, it's really beneficial to, to repot your orchid. And that's what we're gonna do today, okay? So it's a very messy operation. So I would surely advise you to work in your kitchen as I am here uh, today. Uh, I would cover it with blankets or uh, towels or newspaper, um, cause you will make a mess. Um, and you'll also need a pair of scissors or pruners, your choice. Um, you know, if you're going to work with multiple plants, it's good to sanitize your tools between plants uh, with either a flame from your, your stove, um, or you can use uh, rubbing alcohol or a 10% bleach solution. Um, and then you're also going to want a variety of pots to work with. Uh, we'll, we'll probably get a, a, along with this uh, later. We'll bring this back up, clay versus plastic. Again, it's kind of a grower's choice. Um, there's there's perks and, and uh I guess non perks for both of uh, using different types of plant material and different types of potting media, as well as different types of containers. Okay, so uh, so much, to, so many variables out there. But fortunately, orchids want to grow, um, and there's a lot of different ways that you can achieve positive results. So I think we often, when we go to the garden center, we often find our plants in plastic pots or so. And you can see here, I just pulled it out of my nice uh, little clay pot here. Um, and that's super important. So no matter what pot you choose, your pot absolutely has to have a drainage hole, okay? All you need is one drainage hole, um, but uh, definitely need a drainage hole. And so we're just gonna hop right in. We got limited time today. So literally, well, all I'm gonna do here, this is an orchid that's been in a pot for, I don't know, I've had this for over a year or so. Um, and um, let's just see what happens. I, you know, the clear pots are really giving me an indication I got pretty decent looking roots. But literally folks, all I'm gonna do, I'm gonna squeeze the pot here. And now if you have an orchid that has tons of roots, now what you can do is you can soak your pot for about five minutes in lukewarm water. And that often allows this, this to be a little bit more of a stress-free environment or allows the, the plant to come out of the pot a little easier. But I'm just squeezing here and trying to break it off where it's kind of gripped onto the plastic a little bit. I'm gonna gently tug on it here a little bit. And I'm just kind of trying to work it out without really pulling too hard. And luckily for me, it, this one's coming out. Okay, and you can hear that bark, I assume, falling off that root ball right away. And then folks, like literally this process, it might be intimidating, but it doesn't take long. It's maybe less than five minutes per plant here at Hillwood. And I'm going to start to unravel the roots here. As I'm, I'm just working my fingers between all that network of roots there, trying to knock off all that old soil. And I'm going to kind of unravel the roots a little bit. And what, I'm, what I would be looking for right now is brown, mushy roots, um, decaying roots. These roots look pretty nice. So I'm, 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 I'm lucky. Now, what I've also found here was the original little peat moss uh, cage here that that plant was originally growing in as a little baby. I'm going to remove, I'm going to cut that out actually so I don't rip any roots. It's that little tiny little one inch peak plug that that plant started in as a little baby. And I'll keep working it down. These roots look very, very nice. 
Okay. And look how long that one is. Okay, so here's my root mass there. Okay. And for me, you know, I'm gonna look in. So, you know, so what you'll see a lot of times when you're looking, it's obvious if you see a black root, a mushy root, a brown root, then, you know, it, a lot of this is up to your discretion. And, you know, it, I, I kind of judge the overall vibe of my root system. Um, and then if I have a ton of mushy roots, well, then maybe I, I you do physically remove those. And, and uh, but otherwise, if your roots all look like in pretty good conditions here, I've got one here. I'm gonna to try to get, I'm gonna pull it. There are people that rather pull their roots rather than cut them to re resist spreading. You can spread viruses and diseases, but with homeowners, I think it's okay. But this is a really good example. I know it's very hard to see over Zoom, but this was an old root that has turned mushy and that outer covering development has turned brown um, and it just peels away. So that was really probably about the only root I'm gonna remove on this plant. Hopefully our next plant has a little bit more issues. Um, and then really pot size all depends on what this root mass looks like. And that's a pretty nice healthy root mass. But yet if you're in doubt, smaller is better than bigger. I start with my pot empty uh, because I wanna make sure uh, I get my roots down. You can also see I'm twisting the plant as I go down because I'm kind of recreating rather than squishing it straight down. I'd like to do the twisting method. I think it's a little gentler on the plants. And he's literally just spiraling down in there, all right? And then I have my plant down and you can see all the roots are in there. And I'm gonna keep spiraling because I like to set them on, not, I don't wanna say I set them deep, but I wanna make sure it's deep enough in the pot so that then once he's planted, um, you know, I, he, he's stable in there. So now I have him in the center of the pot because he's a phalaenopsis. And the entire time I'm gonna just hold that pot with my one hand. And at the same time, I'm gonna keep my, neck, my hand on the neck of the plant. And then I, we were using, this is the bark I'm using today. This is available at every single garden center and store. And you can see it just literally says, uh, you know, it's potting mix for orchids. Really any all purpose potting mix will be fine um, as long as the word orchid is on it. And I think it even says here, um, it lists a whole bunch of orchids and it says for all epiphytic orchids, right? It's that same idea. It's a chunky media to have nice air and plenty of drainage around those roots. And now the tip though is last night I soaked all this bark. It, when it comes out of the bag, it is very, really dry. Um, and so I soaked this for about 12 hours um, and I just drained it off. And then literally folks, I'm holding those plants and I just took a handful. And this actually has charcoal and perlite in it too, but it's 90% bark. And I'm using my fingers. I, I assume you can hear that crunchiness going on. I'm not paying attention to where those roots are. Now, if I had a plant that did not have very many roots and I only had two or three roots in that pot, I would probably be a little bit more careful and make sure I was putting in the bark and maybe being a little bit more protective of those two roots, but it's fine. You, it's better to be firm now rather than having a pot that's uh, a plant that's loose in that container. So I'm gonna just work my way around. I'm using my two fingers here no tools. I don't want to really want to push them down with tools because I want to have, I feel like I have a little better sense or gauge of the situation with my fingers. Again, pulling it down. I like how he's nice and perky now, um, you know, and uh, rather than sitting like this. And folks, we're already done number one. Okay, it's as easy as that. And now what I would do now, if, if it, this is daring to do this, but with a clay pot, but the trick is if you can pull up your plant without it falling out, it means that you have that bark uh, in there tough enough. I would not do that if I was growing with very few roots there, but I knew this had a lot of roots. But if it was too loose, you would just pull the plant out. Okay, so number one's done. Number two here, I've already cheated a little bit. I took a phalaenopsis that was growing in more of the, the sphagnum moss here. Um, and I already kind of deconstructed it to kind of get us a little head start here. Um, you know, its roots are also fairly decent, but I do see up here, there's some, there's a few roots that aren't necessarily so nice. Uh, and there's a little bit of brown. I know it's very hard to tell on screen, but I'm literally gonna go in there right now with my scissors and I'm snipping out some of these roots, let me just fail. 
you know, if you wanted, you're not going to hurt. If you accidentally cut a real root, it'll be perfectly fine. Um, but what I like about this is you can start seeing the brown there at the end. That's the kind of the brown mushy rot. But, you know, sometimes you'll have a, a root that's beautiful and then it's brown for an inch and then it's beautiful again. That would all depend on what do all the rest of the roots look like? Um, am I going to take that root or not? Here's one that's, here's one that's kind of not so attractive. Again, if this root was on a, a, you know, it's not the worst root in the world, but it's not the best root in the world. Again, every orchid person will have a different opinion and some are aggressive and some are not. Now, if you take a look at a root like that, that the, that, that the true root is a really tiny, thin little hair-like structure in the center of this, what, what we call the root. But the vast majority of what I'm holding here and looking at is actually a sponge-like layer called velamen on the outside of the root. And it can be broken, but yet the true root that's inside of the, the center of the velamen could still be perfectly operational. So don't use necessarily, like here would be a good example of one where the velamen has broken and it's a little bit of dark space but yet the rest of that root's fine. So even though it looks broken, it's just the velamen which is broken, which is the little sponge-like coating. So folks, uh, you know, I, I see a little bit of brown down here. That would be a root I would cut off. That's truly a, a sign of rot there. And that would be, and I can also tell it's mushy and flat. Like there's no substance to this part of the root. Cut it. I'm gonna cut this one. I see some brown mushy there. I see some brown mush there. And then this would be a good time too. these flower stalks here. These were the old flower stalks. You could go in with a pair of pruners and take those down um, all the way. And then this is another good example here that shows, do you see this root, right? This is one that's been growing in the air all along. I would not force that into the pot. It's very stiff. Now, again, soaking this in warm water would make this a little bit more flexible. The only reason I would force that into the pot would be if I actually had um, no roots left and I needed something to help anchor. But otherwise, I'm gonna leave those aerial roots outside the pot. And here we go, I, I got my roots in. I, I chose a slightly larger pot, like I could go, I don't know, maybe I should do this, I should do this size pot. Again, if you're in doubt, you go with a slightly smaller pot all the time. The smaller the pot, the better. Again, these plants are not used to having, um, you know, soil around their roots. They're, these roots are used to in nature. They're growing up in the treetops, so they have air around them. I'm doing my little spiraling thing. Now I'm gonna hold the neck of the plant, grab big chunks of fresh bark here. I'm gonna do a little bit on both sides as I go. After this is all done, I tend to, uh, uh, I will water, but yet this will completely drastically change your watering regime because, you know, after two years or an older bark will stay a lot more moist, right? Now I have this brand new bark. Water's going to fly through this 90 miles an hour, which is great, but yet it's also going to dry out quicker. So you have to kind of keep that in mind. Some extra misting is helpful after repotting because then, you know, if you did break some roots, you know, that misting just helps maybe that plant absorb a little bit of moisture. Again, I'm going to try to get, you know, I'm trying to reset it down a little bit lower than it was in the previous pot. I'd like to have a nice perky plant. So he's pointing upwards there. Um, also the correct timing, spring is the correct time. Um, I should have pointed out on this plant, you know, we have a brand new leaf starting here and there's actually another little tiny leaf. So, you know, you don't want to repot when it's in bloom. You don't want to repot when it's spiking, like enjoy the spike, enjoy the blooms. Um, you know, this is a traumatic, uh, it is a traumatic experience. So do, uh, don't do it while it's blooming because if it's, if the orchid gets agitated, it's going to drop its flowers. Um, and then, um, but yet often our orchids bloom in late winter, early spring. Um, so this is the time of the year. Um, now through about June is the ideal window. So when you see a new leaf, or you see a new root coming out, like that's, if you can get both of those at the same time, which often is spring, um, that's the time to repot your orchid. Because now I know this plant is getting into a period of active growth. It's gonna root in really well um, and so forth. Now let's, I know I'm already out of time. This went so quick. 
here's a big cat lion, okay? This has a very different growth habit. Um, rhizome, rhizome here, here was the growth that bloomed. It just finished blooming a couple of weeks ago. Like this is my main growing point, but I actually have a growing point over here too. So this plant is actually growing in two different directions. So let's see what these roots look like. Um, bark based media here, lots of roots. I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm just gonna start using my fingers to kind of tickle that root ball. Again, if I had soaked this for 10 minutes in lukewarm water, it makes a bigger mess. And I didn't, I didn't think it would work so well in this presentation, but at home, you can take more time, soak it down, and then these roots are a little bit more pliable and flexible. Again, I, and the reason I'm repotting this one is I think I've had it for two years. The bark wasn't that bad, but it was starting to outgrow the pot. And the next growth is gonna come out here. And this was the edge of the pot was here. So I, I wanted to make sure, you know, when the new growth comes out a few weeks after the new growth starts, which it has not started yet, um, new roots form. And so then hopefully all those new roots will get down into that pot too. Again, just kind of, Loosening it all up. I'm turning to the gauge. You know, this is also a great time when you're repotting to look closely, inspect for pests and diseases. Scale and mealy bug love to kind of hide down here along at the base of the pseudobulbs or kind of in the crown of a phalaenopsis. Any nook and cranny they can get into. Good time to take your rubbing alcohol, uh, 70%. Rubbing alcohol is a great little resource for any homegrown uh, orchid. Uh, you take a Q-tip and you can wipe off any disease, or not disease, I'm sorry, insects. And again, folks, I wish I found more brown roots on this because I would be trimming more, but these roots look pretty nice. But you can, you can almost take an orchid down to virtually no roots because, um, especially if you're doing it at the correct time, which is spring, you know, an orchid has each year, there's a part of its annual cycle where it puts out a flush of new roots. So um, if you get it right before those new roots come out and you're in a rescue mode, um, then you could, you, could, you could do this while um, you have virtually no roots, if you have to chop everything off. Or sometimes it's easier just to say, I'm going to go shopping again. I'm gonna throw this plant in the trash and I'm gonna start over fresh. So folks, I, I wish I saw more roots here. I'm not gonna to trim too much because I wanna get them in his new pot and we're almost out of time. So for this one, you know, would I go in this pot, you know, or this pot would be fine, but yet it doesn't really give him enough. Well, you know what? It gives him a little bit of space to grow, but yet I might be adventurous. This guy actually has three leaves growing on it. So I'm gonna, and I'm not so good at repotting my orchids as much as I probably should here at home as we are at Hillwood. So I'm gonna go with a slightly bigger pot and I'm gonna hold it. I'm gonna hold it right at the level I want it the whole entire time. Let me get it, let me get a better grip here. Right about there. And here we go again. Drew, while you are potting that up, we do have a lot of wonderful questions that I am going to start yep. throwing your way. As Drew mentioned, we do want to make sure we are being um, cautious with all of your time and know that we've got about another five, 10 minutes or so together. Um, of course, if you need to scooch out early, we absolutely understand, but we will keep We'll stay here and answer questions as long as they're coming in. So please don't be shy. Um, but while you're working right there, Althea asked if there's a way to divide a cattleya like that yes. when it's got two different growing points yeah. and yeah. when you should do that. I would do it right now. I, I, I realized I was talking, I wasn't paying attention. I started getting too high in the pot, so I got to reset it. But um, so the general rule is three pseudobulbs, but really I, I think it's better to have five, six. So meaning like you, you don't want to have just one little tiny growth. The bigger you can make your divisions, the better. To me, I don't feel this plant is appropriate or ready, but yet this would probably be the minimum size of a cattleya that I would split into two. And that is, yeah, if you had a, a fresh growing point on this side and a fresh growing point on that side, and you wanted two plants rather than one, then yes, you, you could split it. 
Excellent. And that dovetails a little bit with Belinda's question about how or when to remove little orchid babies, which I have learned this month are called kikis. And then what, what to do with those and how to plant them. Yeah, so if it's a kiki on a phalaenopsis is maybe what we're talking about. Often on the phalaenopsis stem, a little tiny baby phalaenopsis will form up on the leaves or up on the, the bloom stalk at some point. Um, I would wait till that little kiki formed a couple roots that were an inch or two long, and then you could simply cut it off and then you pot it up into a little, maybe, you know, a little tiny pot. And maybe then, you know, you have a baby plant, baby roots. So what I would do is I would go through this bark and I would, I would, you know, separate it and maybe use all the finer, smaller pieces that come and maybe not use the big chunky pieces. So that these are the games that you play. A cat Leia could use the big chunky pieces, but a baby Kiki would want a little bit finer media. Excellent. And um, Therese asked a question, and this is a really great question, Therese. I am also a bit novice orchid grower, and she asked if we could refresh her memory about um, what the best type of orchid mixture is, whether it's bark, sphagnum moss. I know there are different schools of thought, so you will get different advice from different places. Um, but she also noticed that all of the pots you are using today are clay. Yes. Uh, so I, that, that multi-part multi, multi question. Uh, clay, I'm a fan of clay. There are growers that grow with clay, growers that grow in plastic. Clay is, uh, the roots can attach themselves more easily. I brought this one as an example. You could see what that root has gripped onto the side of that pot, right? So it can make repotting a little bit more challenging. Of course, the three plants we did today, I pulled out of plastic pots instead of clay. Clay, I would definitely soak for five minutes in lukewarm water. And then you're able to pry these roots off a little bit easier. Um, but, it all, but yet, in the long run, clay breathes more, and I want to create more of that air exchange. And I, the, the worst thing to do is to keep an orchid too wet. So this allows an orchid to dry down between waters a little easier. And then the first part of that question, the mix, it really depends on you know, your personal preference. But that's why I grabbed these two, because these are the two you see at every single home improvement store. It's a bark-based mix or the old sphagnum moss. And the only reason I recommend this is because a lot of orchids that you buy at the grocery store are grown in this. And that's, I think, because the mass, these mass growers have learned how to perfect and it ships a lot better is my theory, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to growing a plant in bark. So, uh, but phalaenopsis grow well in both medias. Excellent. Nancy adopted an orchid from one of her friends, and it has a lot of those aerial roots above the soil line. She mentioned that they get black when she waters and wonders if that means that they should be removed. Well, I wouldn't remove. If anything, they do change color. I would describe it more. They go from white to green often. I don't know about black, but if they're it's because they're absorbing water. So I would not remove any roots that are growing out naturally. That's just how an orchid naturally grows. In nature, as soon as those roots touch something, it's going to grip on. Um, so um, again, unless when you're repotting, you don't have any roots to put into the pot to help anchor it, then I would let those roots uh, uh, stay out in the air at all times. Excellent. Marion has three different orchids in the same pot and is wondering, watching what you're doing here, wondering whether those should be potted individually. Yeah, at Hillwood, we don't really intermingle more than one plant per pot. You know, I'm trying to think of an example, but yeah, often as gifts, there'll be more than one orchid in a pot. I would generally recommend to take those apart and make them three separate pots. Um, I think that's just a kind of a norm in the orchid world. And at Hillwood, we do reuse pots. Yes, Can you yes. talk a little bit about how they should be cleaned in between yeah, uses? Good question. good question. Now, if you're at home and you just have a couple plants, you don't have to worry too terribly much. But yet, if you want to be safe, a 10% bleach solution soaked for about 20 minutes would be a great way to sanitize much of your pots. At Hillwood, we're very concerned with viruses. Um, so for us, even clay pots, we actually bake in the oven for about 400, 450 or so for an hour or so to, to, to even give it that extra step of 
of cleanliness. Plastic pots are a little bit easier in a way to keep sterile. They're easier to clean, right? Because they're not porous. So yes, 10% uh, bleach solution, baking them, using a new pot. But yes, uh, we're constantly, um, we reuse our pots over and over again. If you're gonna repot it, the same plant into the same pot, then you don't have to worry about sanitizing. It's when you start mixing things up or again using, uh, you know, today was a bad example. I use my scissors on two different plants. At Hillwood, we do not do that. Um, we are using a, actually a propane torch to sanitize our scissors. Much more protocols when you have an old collection of 2000 orchids that's filled with pest and disease just because of the size of the collection. Compared to your phalaenopsis that you bought at the grocery store, those things come, um, I've never seen a bug on those. I mean, they're, they're clean, sterile little things. It's when you have a big collection of plants that you start running into pests and disease and viruses and such like that. That dovetails beautifully to Karen's question. Are mealybugs bad for other plants or do they cause problems for humans? Yep. I don't know if they cause problems for humans other than just being weird and, and gross to have in your home. But yeah, mealybugs, you know, they have a certain host range, but there's a lot of plants that mealybugs like. So, um, and house plants and orchids, um, they don't really, uh, yeah, uh, discriminate between the different ones. So yeah, mealybugs are tricky. Mealybugs, super easy with alcohol. Um, you know, at Hillwood, we release beneficial insects that actually spend their whole lives uh, roaming around the greenhouse looking for mealybugs to eat. Um, there's a lot of different uh, organic um, and, and safe controls, but I would not worry about mealybugs. Mealybugs are only on the plants. They're not going to be crawling on your furniture or moving into your bedroom and your pillows. Like, they're only on the plants. Um. Nancy had a follow up to her question about those aerial roots. Yep. They are not growing up or just straight out. They are curving back down towards the soil. Yeah, so my question would be maybe, you know, sometimes they do that when they're looking for fresh soil or they're, you know, has that plant been repotted? So often you'll see that on a plant that's not been repotted for many, many years and the soil's really nasty um, and, and decomposed and soured. So then, yes, all of those roots, you know, uh, they might be avoiding the soil. So, um, yeah, you know, that's a, there's a lot of reasons why a plant do that. And some plants might just naturally want to put out a lot of aerial roots too. Um, yeah. Marion said she is trying to concentrate minis. Should those be treated any differently? Yeah. Uh, no, yeah, I, I like a lot of minis too. So minis fit well on the windowsill, right? And you get a lot more in the same space. So for minis, I'm looking at this guy. I planted this multiple years ago and the bark on it is tiny. So I, I think that's, you know, Again, it depends on exactly what, you know, where is this plant from? What's it like in its native habitat? But in general, I would say minis also need to be repotted regularly. Um, and then I would probably tend to use a much smaller grade bark. Um, and maybe that's for a specialty bark or you're really going through all of this, this bag that has a bunch of different sizes. Um, and you can look uh, a good place at Kelly's Orchid Supplies is a pretty nice uh, uh, pocketbook friendly um, uh, site on the web, on the internet that has a lot of different types of soils and all this that you can work on uh, and choose from. Terrific. That also dovetails and touches a little bit on Diana's question about since each orchid has special needs, they're, they're independent beings. Sure. Um, do you water all of yours at the same time? How do you keep track of how you care for one versus another and make sure that they're each getting what they need, but also maybe don't get lost in the shuffle? A good and complicated question altogether. So at Hillwood, we have a, Andrew Beatable is our orchid specialist. He is there five days a week. That's his job. So uh, lots of individualized attention, okay? Um, our patio petalums get watered twice, if not three times as often as our big old cattleya specimens, right? 
different times of the year, different orchids get watered differently. Cymbidiums and noble dendrobiums get no water for a couple months during the dead of winter. So, you know, it depends on which plant we're talking about. Phalaenopsis, our most common one, we water those about once a week. Um, and yet, but yet, the, the, and it stays fairly consistent year round, but yet in the summertime, we'll be watering more often than we do during the winter time. So once a week said not a bad way to start, but again, it depends. Is your media brand new like these now, or is it two years old, right? That's gonna drastically change how often I water. I know now I'm gonna to have to water these couple more frequently than this guy growing in moss that's been around you know, for two years now, um, because this moss, is stays, moss in general stays wet longer than bark, but now we have old moss and new bark. So this is gonna stay wet four times longer than this. So now to make your answer easy at home, I water every time on the weekend. So everybody gets watered once a week and you know, that's when I have time to do it. But even then I'm still kind of playing around and maybe I'll skip uh, certain plants for uh, maybe a week um, or I summer my plants outside during the summertime and then they're getting a lot more uh, natural rainfall as well as me watering during dry periods. So once a week's an easy answer, but it all depends on season species, how old your mix is. Drew, I think you've been reading that chat from very, very far away there. Um, yeah. I'm impressed. You keep giving me really great transitions. Anna asked early on um, if you can talk about when it is folks who summer their plants outside should move them there. Is it after yeah. we know we've had the last frost warning yeah. or wait until it's really warm out? What, when do you try to do it? it so I, I'll make my easy answer again because I move them all out the same day, but that's probably around May 15th. So after the last frost, but yet Phalaenopsis are warm loving, you know, so they would be the, the most sensitive. Um, and they also like a pretty, sh almost full shade during the summer outside. Um, and then I wait, you know, there's a, the fall chill is the great way to help your orchids know um, to kind of slow down their vegetative growth and their root growth and to start thinking about blooming. So uh, that's a great reason to summer them outside. Um, and I will leave mine out until it really does get chilly. Um, but maybe the first ones I pull in are my phalaenopsis and then my other orchids, you know, I I'll leave out a little bit longer. But again, I don't let any, I don't let frost touch anything. A few nights in the upper 40s, I think are fine. But when you start seeing like 42, 43, 40, as you know, that first cold snap. Everybody in comes inside. Then it's time, then it's time, you know. But then there's some orchids that are cool loving like cymbidiums and they, they almost can take a light, light frost. Uh, they really want the cold. So it species uh, dependent a lot of that. Judith asked if you should wait a while to fertilize once you get things into a fresh pot or if you should start fertilizing right away. It's a wise, it's a probably a wise idea. Um, uh, you know, some, there's a, there's, there's a split decision even on, you know, do you water right away? Like, luckily my, this bark was all moist, but yet the idea behind that is if you've broken roots, you know, the plant needs to kind of rest a little bit. That's where that period of maybe you don't put them back in the extremely hot sunny window, but rather maybe the less sunny window for a bit. That's where that extra misting comes into play. It's a bit like being in uh, the ICU unit, right? So you just went through all that, like let's give you a little bit more shelter um, and shade. So yeah, once then once maybe after a few weeks when you, you know, maybe you'll start seeing that new growth come or if everybody looks happy and perky, then you could start putting the fertilizer back on. But, you know, I think a bigger question is to make sure you don't over fertilize your orchids or go gangbusters, you know, a little bit goes a long way um, with orchids. Wilhelmina says she's got three orchids in full bloom right now and knows that they will still be blooming into June. Yep. So she wonders if it's okay to repot them after that June guidance yeah. or whether she should wait till next spring or what happens if they bloom again next year. I mean, Wilhelmina, what a terrible problem to have on your hands, right? Like you can't find the winter <laughs> repot. So uh, yes, you know, a fail, if, now if we're talking about phalaenopsis, you know, because they're ever growing, a phalaenopsis you could almost do year round, but that's, but a cattleya, no, like I would really want to tar target my cattleyas to right when this time of the year or when there's a new growth. Like I would not want to do this in the fall or early winter. Phalaenopsis, because they grow year round, they just grow a lot slower in the winter. 
um, you could probably get away with it. Um, you can also repot while they're in bloom, but why risk it? So, you know, I just threw out June there because normally by our collection, our phalaenopsis are still often still going into June too. And at a certain point, July or August, we say enough's enough. Like, and we actually cut the bloom stalks off so that the, that, that energy of the plant could go back to leaves and roots and begin to gear up for, you know, it's always best to have a fresh stem come up. So, you know, so you could still cut it and you could still pot it as late as July and August if we're talking about a phalaenopsis. Excellent. Um, Elizabeth just asked an excellent question about whether folks can come back and revisit this tutorial. And the answer is absolutely. This will be up on YouTube generally within a day or so. Um, it depends a little bit on how easy it is for our IT team to get it edited and posted. So thank you very much to George, who is hiding in the background here and who will get this posted for us probably by the end of the day tomorrow. If you are looking for more information on orchids or realizing you started with repotting and have a lot more questions, you can also find on Hillwood's YouTube channel, Drew's excellent Orchid 101 and the tour of Hillwood's greenhouses, which also has a good kind of entry level, what does an orchid need for basic care? We still have a couple more questions and I am absolutely gonna keep asking them. Um, the first one that just came in is whether you have a particular reference book on orchids that you really like. And we talked about this a little bit last week. Yeah, you know, I have a stack of about 15 books, but I, you know, there's the internet nowadays. So um, I would recommend to go to the American Orchid Society um, they're old school. They've been around forever. I really like their advice. It's, it's plain and logical. Um, and they have little care sheets for each plant. I think American Orchid Society, it's free. Um, and check out that first. And yeah, I don't have, there's not one book to me that stands out as a, an amazing reference for orchids necessarily. Michelle asked if you receive an orchid and it doesn't have a drainage hole, is that something you should repot right away? Uh, you know, so you, often you'll get a, an orchid in a plastic pot and then you can sit that inside of a, a nice, you know, decorative pot and, and then, but yet you want to take it out of that pot when you water it so that you allow all the water to flow away. So yeah, if it's in a container that it's directly potted in a container without a drainage pot or a drainage hole and it's been in there for more than a year, yeah, I and it's not blooming and you wanted to save it, yeah, I would think that's an emergency situation that you would wanna repot as soon as possible um, and get it out of that boggy situation. What happens if we are a little overzealous when trimming off roots? Is there any guidance on what happens? Just takes no, a little yeah. longer for that yeah. next bloom? Potentially, but not necessarily. I think if, if, if you know, there's different people. Different people are more aggressive than others. Even you know, at Hillwood, we have about ten volunteers that help us do, do repotting. So all of us would be giving a slightly different answer to that exact question, right? And maybe some of it depends on your mood of that day. But the idea is, the reason you would be aggressive is because you had tons of mushy brown roots and that's not gonna help that plant come around anyway. So cutting them off gives you the best chance of new roots being able to develop and then go into a new media that isn't filled with dead, decaying, mushy roots, which have pathogens in them and all that that's spreading to your now your fresh roots. So that's the logic of being aggressive. So I, if I had to be extremely aggressive, then I would definitely take it out of that sunny window, give it the ICU treatment. Maybe it's daily misting, or if you don't have a humidity tray, you know, adding more humidity would help compensate for not having roots. Um, and then, you know, back to that fertilizer question, okay, I would definitely hold off on fertilizing if I have a sick, unhealthy plant, um, and I think it's in trouble. Um, yeah, I think you give it a little bit, you baby it a little bit more, and maybe then, maybe, you know, that might be an example, too, where, you know, um, sometimes at Hillwood, we call it our, our ICU treatment, is we will mix in a little bit of sphagnum moss with our bark-based mix, because that will stay, it'll stay moister. And so maybe, maybe you don't want to plant, put a plant that has no roots into this dry, airy media. Maybe that's just too dry. So maybe we're going to mix in a few, you know, 10, 20% of this with our bark. So then we have a little bit more of a moisture retentive media 
um, you know, so many games to play. The options are limitless, which limitless. is part of the fun. Yeah. Um, we got a question about how you clean the outside of pots, particularly those that are starting to show some of that leaching or mold. And if there's a way to do that while the plant is still happy in it. I don't know the answer to that. I, you know, I kind of like, that's why I like clay. I, I kind of, you know, I, I just took a, a, a rag and went over these myself. So, um, you know, I'm not sure, you know, plastic maybe, or then maybe that's where you, if, if you want a nice clean pot, you put your growing pot inside of a decorative pot so that you only see that pot, you know, during times of, uh, you know, when you're, re when you're watering or such. So, um, yeah, as particularly clay pots will build up the salts and residues and, and you know, yeah, glazed pots won't uh, necessarily pull as much of that, that algae or the salts out. So maybe glazed um, terracotta is better than natural terracotta. Excellent. Marion asked if a new plant arrives in lasting, is it okay to leave it in that plastic and just put it into a decorative pot? Yeah, I, yeah, I'm glad this question came up because I would say if you just got your orchid, let it be for a year. Like if it's a brand new gift uh, or you just got it from the grocery store and it's a phalaenopsis, that thing is most likely in a good situation now. So especially if you're new to orchids, enjoy it for a while, let it get onto a, that annual cycle in your home. Um, and then, you know, maybe it's, it's next spring, you know? So yeah, it's perfectly fine to leave it in the, in the moss or in the plastic pot that it, it came in from the store. Why not? You know, the idea of repotting, it's every two to three years, but I guarantee there's people watching that haven't repotted their orchid for nine years and it's probably still doing okay, but they're the exception. You know, the longer you go between repottings, the more likely you're gonna have a massive root loss because you're, you're overwatering. It just becomes a sour, a sour mess inside that pot. So, you know, once a year is probably too frequently, but yet lady slippers, we tend to repot our lady slippers much more frequently than our big cat layers. So again, you know, maybe those miniatures get repotted a little bit more frequently than a big old plant, you know, that's the, that's the game. Well, and it is the beauty of that annual cycle and our annual celebration of Orchid Month because you can tune in next March, hopefully in person at Hillwood, but we'll have more refreshers and more advice for the situation we'll all find ourselves in after another year of growth and renewal. Um, Marion asked whether you use special water, distilled water, spring water, anything like that, or if DC uh, at, at Hillwood, it comes right out of the DC tap water. Um, and uh, but at home, I would I use tap water at home too. I like to, you know at Hillwood, it comes out whatever temperature DC tap water comes out. Uh, but at home, you know, and I have a choice. I will use. I will turn a little bit of heat on, so it's it's not it's tepid. I suppose room temperature water. Um, and then, you know, but rainwater is great. If you can collect rainwater, and I don't know enough about reverse osmosis or distilled water, you know, um, but uh, I don't think, I don't think that's a necessary step um, for the vast majority of orchids out there. Terrific. Ruth also mentioned she's got a fail that is not growing straight up yep. and wondered what your advice on that is. I wonder if she's looking at one, like I, I was gonna show this one. You can see what he's doing here. And this is one that's terribly in the need of repotting, but yet he's got a bloom stalk coming. So I'm gonna enjoy these blooms. And then, yeah, so this is one that's it's wobbly. It's barely in there. I can see roots down in there, but yet this one, this one's showing many signs of like a, something's going wrong, right? And this is what phalaenopsis do often. They'll start to grow more and more one-sided. So what I would do is I would reset this, which is kind of what I try to do with these guys. And I would probably bring my soil level up next time to like here. And so I'm gonna bury this, this two inches that's now exposed. Um, I'm gonna bury that. And then I will gently kind of, you know, push his little head up and he might look a little bit odd at first. Maybe it's, maybe it's a gradual thing, right? Um, over a couple of years, but uh, 
but yeah, why not, you know, kind of, yeah, you reset them so that they're looking at the right angle, but it doesn't hurt the plant at all to be at that angle. That's perfectly fine. If the phalaenopsis, you want to make sure that you, you don't necessarily, if it's perfectly standing upright, you can get a lot of water stuck in the crown. And that's particularly uh, dangerous if you're summering outside and we have five nights of rain in a row and you keep getting water and water in the crown. So in that respect, you know, a plant kind of tilted, um, you know, this guy is not going to hold water in his crown because he's, you know, he's sideways. The advantage of growing on a tree limb somewhere, right? Yeah, at exactly. some strange an angle. Don't you worry about, uh, yeah, uh, drainage and all that when you're dangling up in the air. We got a question about whether repotting a cattleya, whether you can pull off kind of the old bulbs. Yeah, yeah. So back to our cattleya here, the question is old bulbs. So, you know, if you only had one growing point and you wanted to keep your plants small, I think that'd be a, a better logic. Like I would ask, like, why do you want to do that? Is it because you have a big old cattleya and you don't want to just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger? So yeah, what you would do then is eventually uh, once this thing's four times this size, you probably have certain areas of the plant which are kind of done for, or they're old, they're called old back bulbs, and they're not really productive anymore. It's good to have a few old bulbs because, you know, this plant, these older ones are helping to grow the new ones, and it's still young and vigorous. So at a certain point, yes, if you have an old cattleya that has a lot of older growths without signs of new growth, yes, you could, you could cut those out. Um, you know, often you could pop those up and that sometimes stimulates it to put out a little, like if it has a little hidden eye or a little shoot, you might get a little bit of a sprout if you want to, you know, propagate the orchid. But yeah, you could remove old pseudobulbs. Also, another thing we'll do at Hillwood a lot because we have a lot of uh, scale and insects. Uh, we will actually remove some of the papery sheets that are surrounding the pseudobulbs. That helps, especially if you have pests, you don't have to do that. But that's where pests get hidden and hide in that. So that would be a reason to do that. But I don't think I would necessarily remove pseudobulbs unless I was trying to downsize that plant to fit it into an appropriate size pot. Terrific. When flowers on bloom stalks fade, yep. do you clip the bloom stalk then? Do you wait until all of the blooms fall off? I had a feeling this question was coming, Erin. So I have this one here. Look, one flower left, right? We're all at this point. Like, it's kind of sad. This has been beautiful for months, right? So um, the trick, you know, it's time. I, I was thinking about doing this one today, but, you know, I, I'm going to enjoy my last bloom, okay? But, yes, eventually what, what would we do it at Hillwood and I would do at home is now, any day now, I can come in with my pruners and I would chop, you know, all the way down where it's, where that bloom, well, you know, I'm trying to get all the way down, that bloom stalk all the way down as close as I can between the leaves and then snip it there. Um, the trick that people will often bring up, the second part of this question that wasn't asked is, can I cut it along the stem? And yes, if the first flower fell off here, then you could cut just below that. And sometimes that plant will then put out one of these nodes that's coming up the stem you might get a little tiny little uh, squirt of a stem that maybe puts out three or four flowers. Um, but yeah, that produce, that's been taking a lot of energy off of this plant. And so instead of growing new leaves and new roots, now I'm putting all this energy into growing three or four more flower buds. I think it's time just to cut it. But yet these still have green tips. So as long as you still have green tips, it might produce more buds, you know? But as soon as that tip turns brown or tan, then it just starts to work its way back to the stem. And then I, then it's a very clear sign. Just cut it, get it on your annual cycle. Again, it's always better to have a fresh spike coming up rather than continually trying to force these to bloom. But people that have found the perfect spot in their home with the right window, the right lighting, um, and maybe as well Amina has found, you can have a phalaenopsis in bloom for four to six months. Um, that's not uncommon at all, um, especially bigger, older plants. So. It is a little tricky to figure out how to get all these things in that you got to do um, when it's in bloom all the time. But again, terrible problem to have. So Terrible problems. The other thing I know sometimes it's hard for those of us who only have one or two plants to say goodbye to those blooms or that chance of having it reflower. 
I am spoiled as I know Drew is. I just come to Hillwood's greenhouses and enjoy those when it's time to cut off bloom stalks. So I think I have gotten to all of the questions that have come in. If I missed one, please type frantically because I want to make sure that we answer all of our questions. But I think we have gotten to them all. Sometimes they come in really quickly. So I am mostly stalling at this point to see if anybody is typing. Um, but as I said, Drew, what, what is happening in the gardens right now? Uh, well, it's the spring season, right? So it's th th there's a reason why people come to the gardens in April and May. So right now, all the gardeners were planting our spring annuals. So things like pansies and stock and snapdragons, osteosperms, all these little flowers that can handle cool conditions. At the same time, all of those bulbs we planted last fall are all emerging. Some of the early bulbs are starting to bloom. So uh, is blooming, the magnolias, I bet by next week we'll have some magnolia flowers, camellias are going. It's really becoming, you know, this is the season, right? And in a couple more weeks, we'll be overwhelmed with the flowers. This, it really is the season where things start to change every night. And as yeah. someone who doesn't do the hard work out there, I am so appreciative of your hard work and being able to just come and enjoy the beauty. So I hope that our friends who joined us today are able to do just that and come visit Hillwood soon. Um, thank you all very much for being here, for your great questions. And Drew, thank you for sharing your home orchid collection with us today. You're more than welcome. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.